All right. So awesome to have you all here. We'll wait uh, just a few seconds here just to make sure we're all up and running and um, everyone is joining, hopefully. Um, Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to uh, to have this conversation today. It is a hot, hot topic uh, in our world right now. And um, I'm so excited to have both of these uh, brilliant minds with us. Um, and uh, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Anna Frick. Um, I am uh, by trade. Uh, I am a mastering engineer. I have a studio in Boulder, Colorado. I also serve on uh, the board of IBMA. And I also serve on the board of trustees for the Recording Academy. So, um, uh, and then along with us, we've got uh, Nicole uh, Cosme, um, and uh, she is a PhD candidate uh, in music theory at Yale University. Uh, she is uh, using machine learning in uh, music audio analysis. Um, she'll tell you all, all more about it here in a minute. And then also with us, we have Todd Dupler who is the uh, chief, uh, chief Advocacy and po Public Policy Officer for the Recording Academy. Um, I'm so excited to have you both here uh, to talk about this. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna start with uh, having Nicole kind of give us an overview of generative AI, uh, how, how it pertains to, to music. Um, and then uh, I wanna have Todd give us an update on what's going on on Capitol Hill um, all the all the issues going on there um, with regard to AI, and then we'll open it up to uh, some discussion. So uh, all of you tuning in, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and they will get sent over to us um, while we're chatting. So uh, I'm gonna kick it over to you, Nicole. Please take it away. Sounds great, thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen and we will get started. Um, great. All right, can you um, can you see my screen okay? Uh, it says it's loading right now. Oh, okay. Um, it has paused for some reason. Um, let me try again. Um, okay. Mm. Is that still not? No, it's doing the same thing again. Huh. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was showing it when you, uh, before you hit slideshow. So. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, that is strange. Let me. There it is. There it is. There it is. Okay. Great. Yeah, I don't know why it was paused. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm the tech person and I have tech problems. <laughs> Go figure. Um, okay, so I'm Nicole. Um, yeah, as Anna mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at um, Yale University and I take apart um, different kinds of AI uh, algorithms that work on music and I'm gonna try to figure out how they work and uh, you know what's going on there. Um, but I'm also a musician, and I think it's in, really important to say. Um, so this talk kind of came about um, because my husband and I and most of our friends are bluegrass musicians uh, here in Brooklyn, and uh, I play some fiddle and I do some flat picking. Um, so my talk today is very much inspired by the conversations that we've had over the last year um, as we're trying to kind of navigate this season of technological change. Um, and I've gotten lots of really great curious questions and concerns from friends um, and from my husband over the last year. Um, and the thing that I've gotten asked kind of most often is how does the tech work um, and what can it do uh, with music? So that's really gonna be the topic of the day for today. And I'm gonna try to shed light on those things. Um, and I also look forward to hearing questions from everybody in the community and thoughts and concerns and all of that stuff. Um, okay, so that should be working. Hopefully it continues to work. Um, so I'm gonna start by playing a recording that kind of caught my attention way back in 2020 um, when we had nothing else to do, <laughs> but uh, scoured the internet looking uh, at interesting things. So, um, yeah. 
the doctor, Bobby Chalmers, to the night we Okay, so some interesting things there. Um, I didn't generate this, but this is from an AI. Um, it's a demo that's meant to help demonstrate the capabilities of an AI called Jukebox that was released by OpenAI in 2020. Um, you all probably are familiar with OpenAI because they also make the um, GPT series of algorithms. Um, and so I think to that effect, this is part of a you know much larger phenomenon. Um, these kinds of headlines are kind of all over the place lately. Um, AI generated art is very much part of the zeitgeist of the 2020s. And so I've got some recent headlines that kind of um, echo the sentiments that I think most of us are feeling or contending with or curious about and have been following pretty closely. Um, and as they kind of suggest, AI-generated art raises a lot of important questions for all of us who consider ourselves artists. So my purpose today is really just to provide a lay of the land of generative AI and music. And I want to talk about um, what this kind of AI is and where it came from and how it works. And my big hope is that all of you who are listening, um, you'll find this useful to yourselves in advocating for yourselves as musicians or songwriters or wherever you might be coming from um, and protecting yourselves from any things that you see as a risk or um, maybe even finding genuine opportunities in the technology. Um, so the general plan for my side of the talk is um, I'm gonna give kind of a background of how AI is used in music in general. And then I'm gonna go into some mechanics about how um, the specific kind of AI called generative AI works with um, music um, in as much detail as I can, as I can afford in, a, in the time frame that we have. Um, okay, so the opening example that I played is really part of this, like I said, like this uh, zeitgeist of the 20, uh, 2020s, and it seemed to pop up overnight, but the zeitgeist bubble really doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, in fact, each kind of AI generated art that we see, writing, visual art, music, all of that stuff, um, kind of has it uh, their own relationship historically with academic computer uh, research, and that's really where this comes from. So AI-generated music specifically is, is a long byproduct of a history of computer-generated music that goes back to the 50s, you know, nearly 70 years. And without this history, uh, we wouldn't have the AI-generated music that we have today. So I want to just do a brief overview of that so you can kind of contextualize where this is, where this is really coming out of. Um, so this is just a, a general overview slide, and we've got some major trends that have happened throughout the decades um, since the 50s. Um, so here in the 50s, we start with mainstream music synthesizers, um, and you can see the RCA Mark I, um, I believe, is, is what's in the picture. And that was, you know, kind of where this all began. You could, you could have um, different notes and different effects like high pass filters and things like that, and you would punch little holes in a paper that would tell you which note to play and which effect to put on that note. And then you would feed it into this machine and the uh, machine would kind of pump out a synthesized version of those notes. And it was really good at making really like strange electronic sounds, really bad at making authentic, um, you know, acoustic instrument sounds, which was what it was trying to emulate. But um, it, this was where it all began uh, by the eighties we get um, this setup kind of compressed into much smaller um, footprints. Uh, we get personal computers, we get um, multi-track uh, synthesizers, and we get MIDI, which is you know, a digital computer language for working with music. Um, and the result of this is that things become much smaller scale, they become much more portable, and people begin to use this for um, commercial music. And we get things like 80s synth pop and you know, all those dance hits and things like that. Um, by the 90s and the early 2000s, um, the synth pop trend kind of morphed into EDM and the programs get um, even smaller in their footprint. So rather than just being a computer, it turns into a, a program on a computer and we get virtual studios, we get new virtual instruments, um, things become more complex and we can do a lot more things with digital music sound. Um, and we also get music informatics research um, or MIR, which is a, a branch of computer science uh, that intersects with music studies um, where people for the first time kind of uh, start to put different kinds of digital music um, recordings and MIDI and things like that into computers to try to extract like trends um, 
for example, in this collection of recordings, which chord progressions happen most frequently, and um, things like that. And that really becomes the precursor for what's happening today. Um, so today, the trend of the moment is really this um, AI bubble that we've been talking about. And it's certainly not the only thing that's happening um, by far, but it is a really important one. And I think it's the biggest trend that's happening in the computer music world. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that um, for the first time, we've really started to uh, we've really started to see audio processing. Um, and that means we've started to get a lot more realistic sounds um, in some ways, some ways still very artificial. Um, but we've started to get sound bites that sound like things that we might record um, and things that start to scare us because of how realistic they sound. Um, and we also start to get um, end user AI tools. Uh, and this means that people without necessarily specialized knowledge of these, you know, big synthesizers and, and programs of years past can start generating their own music. Um, and that's really what we're talking about. Um, and I want to acknowledge that it's weird to talk about a history of electronic computer music in the same breath as it is to talk about bluegrass, because my whole experience with bluegrass has been that it is, you know, an acoustic, it's a live acoustic music. That's like the heart and soul of bluegrass. That's what we all love doing. It's just like sitting outside picking um, with our friends, with community, with family. Um, so it's weird to talk about these things in the same breath, but what's begun to happen is in the AI age, um, bluegrass music that has been kind of commercially recorded and put out to the world has um, been integrated into the collections of music that are used to build these artificial intelligence algorithms. And so regardless of how much we all love that live um, element to it, it has become very much part of, of this AI world. Um, and that's why we're talking about it today. And that that AI Dolly Parton that I played at the beginning is an example of um, an output of what happens when you ask something to play bluegrass. Um, so I wanna zoom into this era of artificial intelligence now that we kind of have a global context. Um, and I wanna look at what AI is doing kind of in the trend of the moment with music. Um, and before I can do that, I really need to define what AI is um, just so that we can all like get on a nice stable footing. So AI start, uh, stands for artificial intelligence and an artificial intelligence algorithm is in its most basic form, just a mathematical system that carries out some task. Um, and you can get as nuanced or as you know basic as you want with this. Um, but that's the definition that I thought uh, to bring to the table here. So I've put a simple AI um, idea at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and this is just housing price prediction. So here I've got um, price, and that is a function of the number of bedrooms and the number of bathrooms of a house, let's say, and I just kind of chosen them arbitrarily. Um, and, and these little letters A and B here are what we'd call weights. And they basically just tell you how important bedrooms and bathrooms are in predicting the price of a house. And so when I talk about building an AI, um, what we really mean is training an AI. <laughs> and what that means is that for something like this, you would just feed it a whole bunch of um, housing listings that have bedroom and bathroom uh, listings. And you would ask the, uh, the AI to say, okay, based on all of these, how important are you know, the number of bedrooms? How important are the number of bathrooms? And can you quantify uh, both of those things and put that number right here in front of each to tell us how important each is in predicting price? Um, and when the AI is fully trained, then those numbers should be pretty stable and you should reliably be able to say, okay, two bedrooms, two bathrooms, we can get a price. And obviously there's many more variables than that. Um, but that's what really this is doing. You're feeding data in and you're training it um, to learn these weights to apply to features to tell you how important they are in completing the task that you want it to do. Um, so let's talk about what kinds of tasks happen in music. Um, so we've got different kinds of music representation here. Um, I've got MIDI data, we've got symbolic data, and this could be something like sheet music or um, tablature, um, ABC notation, anything like that. Uh, we've got audio, including spectrograms, and we've got text, which is not a traditional kind of music data, but we can think about lyrics um, as being text data, very much part of this. Um, and when you feed those things to an AI, all separately. You can do things like um, 
have applications in sound engineering, you can do music recommendation, um, you can do music generation, and you can do lyric generation. Um, and there are certainly other tasks you can do, but these are the major ones um, that tend to come up. And when you think about the different representation types, MIDI and symbolic uh, um, representations of music tend to be used more for like academic research. Um, they tend to be more for like, statistical studies and things like that. But um, when you think about audio data, the stuff that's made, you know, the news recently, the things that are kind of conjuring our conscious thoughts about this are really coming out of the audio domain. And so that's the one that I want to focus on today. Um, I want to talk about audio data and I want to talk about the task of music generation. And really, I want to talk about um, generating audio at the hands of something called a deep generative AI. And we can certainly talk about um, lyric generation in the Q&A, but I just didn't have time to work it in. So let's talk about um, deep generative AI for audio. So we um, said that a, an AI is a mathematical system that learns to do uh, some kind of a task. And a deep AI is just a multi-equation mathematical system that learns to do some kind of task. So slightly different. Um, and I've put this little diagram over here, um, very similar to the one that I had before. You've got these you know, little variables and things like that, and you have your output of price. Um, and we've got these little lines here that are representing those weights that tell you how important each variable is in predicting price. But we've also got this green layer that is purposely, I've left it purposely blank and undetermined. Um, because these are features that the AI will learn. This is the multi-equation part of this definition. And these are features that the AI will learn on its own. And they're not prescribed, you know, they're not predetermined by us. And they change every time the AI trains. And just like with the other equation, it learns these, you know, weights between these features. Um, that will help it learn what it should be predicting as its output. Um, and so... When you think about this deep AI, you can kind of have that picture um, in your mind as we're going along because it'll, it'll become relevant again later. Um, so generative AI is a way of qualifying what kind of task is happening. Um, generative AI is learned to generate new data based on feature that, uh, features that they learn from existing data. Um, so this would just mean that it's taking these green things and instead of predicting price, it's generating, say, a new housing listing or something like that. Um, so when we talk about audio, an audio-based deep generative AI learns to generate new musical audio based on features it learns from existing audio. And that's a definition that I just want to highlight because um, it'll be really relevant for the rest of the talk. Um, okay, so within generation and deep generative AI for audio, we have subtasks, different kinds of things that we can generate um, and different ways that that kind of generation can happen. Um, so I've made this graph and it's showing um, deep audio-based generative AI over time. Um, and you can kind of see some, some large scale trends happening, starting with these blue dots, I've kind of broken them down into large scale classes. So the blue dots represent what I'm gonna call generic audio generation algorithm. Um, these are things like jukebox, which um, played the, uh, which made the sample that I played at the start of the talk. Um, and these are really the first on the scene. They are the first that kind of carve out the space of deep generative audio AI in music. And we're kind of already a bit familiar with what this kind of thing sounds like. Um, jukebox is an earlier, you know, it's an older AI, um, but we can still kind of flag some of its strengths and weaknesses that hold across this class of blue dots. Um, for one, it's pretty good at creating realistic sounding bites of audio, but when you put them together, you know, it struggles to make them make sense over a long term. Um, some of the words are kind of gibberish and yeah, there's all kinds of sonic artifacts that let us know that this is artificial and this is not something, you know, that that was human generated. Um, the second class that I've got here is these orange dots, and these are singing voice conversion algorithms. Um, and I've flagged on the other side of the screen a, um, an AI from 2023, um, an SVC AI that uh, generated the really popular Heart on My Sleeve example that went viral a couple of months ago, the AI Drake and the weekend sample um, that I thought people would be familiar with. Um, and this class of algorithm is quite different because rather than just generating, you know, uh, whole swaths of audio, it is specific to the voice. And so it is able to take someone's voice um, and kind of replicate it such that um, it can be used to uh, generate 
you know, new music, uh, as the Drake and Weekend um, sample proved. It's, it, you know, made quite a big splash. Um, and this one, I think is arguably the most popular of the three um, classes of AI in here for that reason. Uh, there's a lot of out of the box tools that you can use to do this without a lot of programming knowledge, or without a lot of um, computing overhead and things like that. Um, so this has become really popular. And then the third one is text to music, these green dots. And this one is much newer. Um, it's a harder computational problem to solve because you're talking about text and music kind of in the same breath. Um, but what this kind of algorithm can do is um, take a, a description, say like, uh, write me a piece of music that sounds like I could be on a boat in a lake, you know, rowing at sunset or something like that. And it'll generate something that it believes sounds like what that scene should sound like. Um, and whether or not it does is for us all to decide. Um, but that's the goal of this kind of algorithm. So it's much newer, um, but it is something that's popped up in the last couple of years. Um, and so overall, I think it's you know a little bit too early to tell what the real trend is here, but um, audio-based AIs are definitely exploding in popularity across the board. And I think the large scale trend that we can take away is that you know, um, companies or, or research institutions um, can kind of use resources to train algorithms with lots of data and people can, you know, do this within the research lab too. Um, and then they can release these for end users to use uh, with very little overhead or very little programming know-how. And so there's this really, really big um, proliferation of people being able to do whatever they want with generative AI um, in, in this capacity. Okay, so I think we've gotten to the point of the talk where I talk about how someone would actually generate music with one of these AIs and what the mechanics are behind it. Um, so I wanna talk first about the collections of music recordings that you might see um, being used. And these are just some of the popular ones that, that I've seen in my research. Um, so we've got Free Music Archive, um, Music Caps Dataset, and these are just different collections. Um, a lot of them are popular, different kinds of popular musics, or some of them are YouTube clips that have been, um, you know, brought together and, and tagged with some kind of descriptive label. Um, some of them are proprietary, meaning you can't necessarily access them. And these are open source, so you can access them. Um, and the thing to notice is that they have lots and lots of data samples. Uh, this one down here, it, there are a bunch of versions of this algorithm, so I didn't put a number on the number of recordings, but there are a bunch of you know AI singers that have um, lots and lots of recordings behind them. So, and this is, uh, yes, yeah, this is an example of the kinds of music that AI might be listening to. Um, and certainly there are many, many more, but those are, those are some big ones. Uh, okay, so this is a good overview of the generative process behind how this happens. So you've got your collection of recordings, whatever it may be, um, and you've got some kind of a prompt that you want the AI to do, say, um, generate a song in the style of Dolly Parton. Um, and then it goes into some kind of mysterious box and outcomes, some kind of generated recording. Um, so I want to open the box a little bit. So there's really two ways that we can open the box. Um, the first way is that some AIs are what we call open source. And that's really just a fancy way of saying, you know, here's the blueprint of an AI, train your own version of it from scratch. And um, when we talked about training an AI, an AI, ugh, an AI earlier, um, we said that deep generative AIs kind of learn to generate new musical audio based on features that they can extract from existing audio in that, you know, green node layer. Um, that was in that diagram. So when you train a deep generative AI, you're letting it figure out what those features are, what those green circles are and how they relate to each other. And so how those lines connecting them are all related. Um, so in the open source case, a programmer could just download the algorithm's blueprint and code um, and feed their own music into it and then let it go feature hunting. And in this case, um, there's, you know, the programmer has complete knowledge of what music has been fed into that AI. So there's um, some more openness there and the second case here is a little bit more opaque. Um, in this case, the um, this would be something like an out-of-the-box tool that someone else has 
pre-trained. We call these pre-trained AIs because they come with knowledge of a bunch of features that they've already extracted from thousands of recordings. And the downside is that you don't always know what recordings have been used. Um, but the upside for a lot of people, and I say upside with a grain of salt, um, the um, convenience is a better word. The convenience of these for a lot of people is that you don't need to spend a lot of time training them. You can prompt them directly, or you can just feed a little bit of music to them and a prompt, and then they'll spit out something. Um, so there's just a little bit of overhead. So that is really what two options that people have when they do this kind of thing. And that's where this is coming from. Um, the majority of stuff that you see in, you know, the news is starting to come from this kind of pre-trained thing that is just easy for people to access. Um, but certainly there's lots of open source stuff as well. So I want to dive one more layer further. Um, and in doing that, I'm going to provide a really, this is a basic, very reductive um, diagram of what's going on. But no matter which way you open the box, if you choose an open source algorithm or, or a pre-made, pre-trained one, um, what's going on under the hood is really the same thing. Um, you have some set of recordings that you're going to feed into this algorithm. And kind of like we talked about before with that you know green inner layer, it's going to deconstruct those recordings in, into a set of uh, features, and it's going to learn weights between those features that tell you how they're related. Um, and then at some point, it's going to begin separating things and clustering things based on how similar they are. And these things could be features, uh, they could be recordings, it depends on the algorithm, um, but it does um, have this knowledge of things that it deems to be similar based on you know the, the metrics that it has. And then it'll reconstruct. So it'll figure out how to put those features back together um, in some way. Um, and when it generates, this is where it gets really um, interesting and quite scary sometimes, is that to generate, it needs it knows that it needs to create something that's novel or something that's unique. And that is just to say something that's different enough from the recordings that it was trained on. Um, but it still needs to be similar enough to those recordings that it passes, you know, the judgment of whoever is using the algorithm. And so it relies on this similarity space to pull features that are similar and, and you know, or sound bites, whatever they may be that are similar, and but just to juxtapose them in a way that is unique uh, or hasn't been done before. Um, so that's really what's going on here. Um, so I think the big remaining question is what musical features does it does it learn? Um, one of the big things that we heard in the opening example that I played is that it's pretty good. I'd say it's best. This this class of AI is best at extracting things like spectral signatures. And when I say spectral, I mean um, like a spectrogram, a, a time frequency representation that at any point in time shows you all of the you know frequencies, the overtones, all that kind of stuff that's happening. Um, in the musical sound. And one of the things that um, comes from that is the sound of someone's voice or the sound of someone's instrument. Um, and the example that we heard, it's the sound of Dolly Parton's voice. Um, you know, it, it has a spectral signature that the AI can kind of hook into and learn how to replicate. And she didn't necessarily need to know, uh, she didn't necessarily need to say whatever words the generated sample has her say. Um, she said different words and it you know, can figure out how using the signature of her voice um, to reconfigure that into whatever text it's going to have her say. Um, and I think this is something that's that's been in the news quite recently. I don't think this is news to anybody and um, this is going on, but they tend to be really good at this and they tend to be good at things that follow from this. So in my research, I've seen um, AIs that are pretty good at creating short rhythmic loops, um, building chords, doing short chord progressions and things like that. On the whole, they tend to be pretty bad at um, longer chord progression, and they're getting better at it. Um, but anything that happens over the long term, uh, long term form, meter, things like that, um, is harder for um, the AIs across the board, regardless of what kind of AI they are. Um, but this is, and, and certainly there are more strengths and weaknesses. But these are the major ones that I've seen in my research, and and that has, you know, come about from listening to things that come out in the news and, and all of that stuff. Um, I might skip over this one in the interest of time, um, but this just a small diagram to show, kind of to illustrate what I said on that last slide um, on, in a large scale uh, sense 
with form, you know, this is kind of a rambling form. There's there's no chorus that it comes back to. Uh, there's no, you know, repeating instrumental section. It's just kind of going on and on and on. Um, but within these sections, you know, you get little clips of things that are kind of internally consistent in terms of the kinds of sounds that are happening. You get mandolin, you get claw hammer banjo, you get guitar um, in the first part of this. You get, you know, this kind of driving style of singing. Um, by the time you get to the blues section, um, the banjo style has changed completely, which generally wouldn't happen. Um, and you get all different kinds of vocal artifacts. Um, so it's just cycling through these things. And so you can, it's a good illustration of some of the strengths and weaknesses, um, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. And um, we can always come back to it. So really what I want um, people to take away from this and what I hope you take away, um, it's just a couple of key points. The first one is that AI is becoming widely accessible. Um, the second one is that AI is used for a wide variety of musical tasks like music generation, sound engineering, you know, and so on. Um, and then the big hotspot, I think, out of this list really is audio based music generation um, and some lyric generation also, um, both of them happening at the hands of deep generative AI. Um, and in the music side of that and the audio side of that, we get, you know, these different kinds of tasks or these different kinds of ways that audio can be generated, either in a really generic, you know, kind of overview sense, um, in a singing voice conversion sense, where you're just kind of transferring and learning a vocal signature, spectral signature, or in a text to music sense. Um, and the last part is just to hone in on that spectral feature thing, because um, in my research, I've just seen that, you know, this seems to be something that stands out um, time and time again, based on different audio based AIs that I that I take apart, you know, they all seem to be good at learning this kind of feature right away at spectral features and things that derive from them. Um, so I think we can have a really good discussion, hopefully about AI and musical likeness. Um, and yeah, I, I hope all of that is helpful to, um, you know, anyone who's thinking about this, and, and especially musicians and songwriters who are, you know, making your art and, and enjoying it. So yeah, that is my that is my little bit, and I'll stop sharing. Um, thank you, Nicole. That was that was a really great overview, and uh, I have my mind is like going a zillion different places. There's so much to dig in on there, um, and we'll get into it. I'm sure. Um, you know, obviously, there's uh, there's a lot of concerns that are brought up with that. You know, what's input into those models? Is that you know um, copyrighted material? Should it be licensed? You know all that kind of thing. And uh, because of that layer of uh, everything, um, that's why we have Todd here. Um, because, you know, we are um, at a place where we need to uh, protect, um, protect uh, our um, in intellectual property and um, really understand this. And, and, you know, is it gone too far? Or, you know, can we put any boundaries on this? Can we put any safeguards? Um, on it. So uh, I'm going to toss it over to Todd here, and uh, he's going to kind of tell us what's happening um, on on the uh, on the legislative side and, and what the conversations are happening. Um, and uh, I'll toss it over to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Anna. And yeah, thank you, Nicole. That was so incredibly informative and a, a great um, setup for what I'm going to talk about, because I'm going to touch on a lot of the things that you presented. I think actually a lot of policymakers would really benefit from some of those slides to see the way you, you broke that down. Um, it's it's fascinating, you know, as you mentioned at the start, AI is, is part of the zeitgeist right now. It is uh, something that everyone's talking about and, and has been um, throughout the year. And that's certainly true in Washington, DC, among policymakers and lawmakers. Um, it's always really tricky, right, when, when Washington wants to get involved uh, in new technology. Um, they have to tread carefully because they know um, what they are setting a precedent for um, is going to sit and it, and it may last longer than the technology does or the technology may change faster um, than the policies that they put in place. And so um, Washington has kind of approached the AI question uh, with that mindset, kind of learning from things they've done in the past and wanting to do a better job as they face this question. So um, I'm going to I'm going to start by unpacking a few different things that are happening in Washington, both uh, on the administrative side um, with agencies and offices and on the congressional side with members of Congress. And then I'll talk a little bit about how the Recording Academy um, and others in our creative communities have been uh, responding to AI and what we're doing about it. 
Um, you know, on the administrative side, I think some of the earliest action on AI came out of the US Copyright Office. And I think uh, the reason why that happened is because they knew they didn't really have the luxury to sit back um, and, and watch what happens, that they were going to get forced to deal with the question of AI very quickly in terms of what uh, qualifies for copyright protection and what is copyrightable. Uh, and that happened uh, with someone who had created a graphic novel uh, that they submitted uh, for copyright protection. Uh, and so back in March, the Copyright Office uh, issued some pretty extensive guidance on uh, how AI and copyright works and what they would give copyright registration to and what would qualify for copyright registration under their interpretation of copyright law. Uh, in the case of this graphic novel, uh, what had happened was that you'd had um, an author, original author who had written all the text of this graphic novel story themselves originally, uh, but then for the for the images, for the pictures that went into the graphic novel, they used Midjourney, an AI program, to generate the images that went with the graphic novel. And so using that as, as kind of the example, what the Copyright Office said is that things that are created by people are copyrightable, and things that are created by machines and AI are not copyrightable. Uh, in the case of this graphic novel, uh, the written words, the text that this author had done to create the story was their copyrighted work. Uh, the Midjourney created images by themselves were not copyrightable. Uh, put together, synthesized into this graphic novel, um, together that was a copyrightable work um, with those two things together because it had a human element to it. And so what they clarified basically as a rule of thumb is, is that uh, copyrights are for humans. Uh, cop you know, a, a program, a machine cannot uh, apply for or receive a copyright. A copyright is meant to uh, protect human creators. And so when you apply for to register a copyright, you need to disclose whether the work that you created was aided by AI and how the AI was used. And so those elements that are purely created by AI will not be um, protected by copyright, but something that has human involvement, human engagement with it uh, is going to qualify for copyright. And the risk is uh, that you, you need to disclose that up front because if the Copyright Office finds out after the fact that there's AI in, involved in your work, that could kind of jeopardize your status. Um, now, the, the sliding scale question here is um, how much human involvement is enough? You know, where, where does human involvement make the difference? Uh, and that's a question that, that everybody is, is still wrestling with and that they don't um, put strong parameters around that. They know that there's a little bit of a gray area in there, but they at least establish this principle, this idea that there needs to be human creativity and, and a human element involved in creation. Uh, and so that came out in March. And since that time, the Copyright Office has continued to hold listening sessions. They had a number of uh, virtual listening sessions with stakeholders in different copyright industries, uh, including music, um, to hear directly both from technology companies and from creators themselves. And they're going to take all of that that they've heard and, and synthesize that into future policy making. And um, at the end of this, when I when I get to the Recording Academy and what we're doing, it, it's kind of actually very similar in terms of how we've reacted, because, again, we, we understood that we were going to be forced to deal with the issue uh, maybe sooner than we um, would have liked to have. And so we had to work proactively um, to establish a policy. And so I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, but so coming from the Copyright Office, then you have Congress and, and Congress is the one that you know really has the, the stickiest job of how do you legislate and set policy for a rapidly changing, rapidly evolving um, technology. And so, um, again, that AI plays into a lot of different applications um, in the public policy space, certainly national security and defense, um, transportation issues. And as Congress unpacks the effect of AI in all these different industry sectors, our concern is that they not forget about the creative industries, that they understand that there are artists and creators who will also be impacted by AI. Um, you know, not that that national security and infrastructure are certainly should be priorities, but just don't forget that we are also a part of this conversation. And to their credit, Congress has, has definitely um, embraced that. So you've had a number of hearings um, this year in a number of different committees like the Science Committee, like the Armed Services Committee, uh, but also both the House and the Senate Judiciary Committees um, have ho hosted hearings specifically on AI and copyright and AI and creativity. 
um, to dig into those issues. And in every instance, there's been a lot of sympathy um, recognizing that creators and individuals need to be protected. Um, and that's also now carried over to the White House. Um, last week, the White House held a summit with leaders of seven different technology companies, including OpenAI, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and a couple of others, um, where they announced some voluntary principles. Um, so again, not everything has to have the force of law to get things done in Washington. Sometimes you can get voluntary agreements where you get stakeholders and actors uh, to take action on their own independently of legislation. Sometimes the threat of legislation is a good um, uh, hammer to get them to do those things. But in this case, the White House got them to commit to certain principles that they would work towards. Uh, the most interesting of those, um, I think, deals with um, disclosure of, of finding technical measures that would mark an, an artificial intelligence and AI work so that it is easy, easily identifiable and recognizable. And they threw out as that a, perhaps a, a technical watermark um, that would carry with an AI uh, work so that anybody can recognize that it is an AI work and is distinguishable from other works. Um, a lot of other um, of those high level agreements dealt with safety and transparency and accountability. And that's kind of the consistent theme you've seen from Congress as well. A lot of talk about ensuring, again, safety, transparency, um, and accountability, but without a lot of specifics and teeth because um, there are a lot of questions without a lot of answers. Um, as we approach this um, from the creative standpoint, organizations like the Recording Academy, um, you know, I think the things that we are looking at um, which we, was talked about by Nicole, is, is how these AI programs are ingesting information to train, uh, to learn how to create. Uh, and so are they using, you know, public works? Are they using um, open access works? Or are they using copyrighted works? And if they are using copyrighted works to train and, and to create new things, um, those copyrighted works should be licensed, that we should know when those works are being used. There should be a way to see what uh, an AI used to create a work and, and whether those works were copyrighted, whether they were licensed, uh, and whether somebody's being compensated for their use. Um, so that's one uh, key question for us. Uh, and the second question is on the output side. Um, again, this use of, of Im imitative AI works. So like the Drake and the, the Weekend single, um, we've, there's been other examples of that. There's like a whole album created by Oasis, you know, that the, the Gallagher brothers put aside their differences and created a whole new album. Um, but it was all fake, but it sounded pretty good to a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, this deals with an issue called right of publicity or name, image, and likeness for an artist um, that right now at the federal level, there is no federal protection uh, for artists and creators when their, their name and their likeness um, is used without their permission. Um, the, for a long time, there's been a patchwork of state law that protects individual artists from, from their name and likeness being used. Um, right now, about half the states um, have some form of right of publicity law and, and half the states don't. And um, the strength of those laws is, is variable. So um, Tennessee and California, for example, have always had really strong, robust um, right of publicity laws. And Tennessee kind of led the way actually with, with the Presley estate um, a long time ago in, in setting that benchmark. And different states have come in um, with their own right of publicity law. So the Recording Academy last year uh, worked in the state of Louisiana to enact a right of publicity law that um, had never existed before. Um, but a lot of these laws did not contemplate AI and did not um, contemplate this kind of digital replication uh, that we're seeing. And so, you know, we think it, it may make sense to have a federal law, um, specifically speaking to this context of AI works that protects an artist's uh, name, image, and likeness so that um, you aren't seeing these works being put out publicly where people, there is confusion, there is a likelihood of knowing whether that really is the artist that I'm listening to or if somebody is profiting on that artist um, without their permission and, and consent. Um, so those are kind of the issues we're, we're dealing with there. Um, but at, with that, especially for us at the Recording Academy, is a recognition that artists and creators um, have always used technology to create. We've always embraced new things. Again, that, that timeline in the, uh, in the slide deck was really uh, instructive. And you could go back even earlier to things like multi-track recording, uh, to electric amplification, to uh, you know, drum loops and sampling all the way you know, to the current electronic suite of tools that people use. 
um, that these were all disruptive technologies at one point in time and, and disruptive technologies that people thought might be uh, displacing. Um, and in some cases, maybe there was displacement, but they are also now readily adopted tools. And so we think even with AI, there's a lot of potential and a lot of artists that are using AI now to complement and supplement the work that they're doing. Um, we think AI has the potential to open up doors um, to allow new people to come in and create that may not have had access or the right tools or resources to be creators themselves. And even outside of the creative space, um, we know that AI has a lot of different applications on the back end to uh, better match uh, data and make sure that um, you know, song data and, and musical data gets, gets matched properly to um, improve the efficiency of payments and payment systems um, to do things like creating better recommendations for fans and um, you know other administrative tasks like scheduling. So there's a lot of things that AI can do that can be beneficial um, to creators and the people that support creators. Um, and so we hold that kind of intention with, this, with these other areas of concern that we have um, and want to make sure that um, it's clear that we know that AI is coming, that AI is gonna be a tool that we use and, and how do we make sure um, that artists are protected where they need to be as we move into this new framework uh, using AI. And so for the Recording Academy specifically, um, you know, we're best known for the Grammy Awards. And so we knew um, that while we might want to wait all year to, to collect information the way policymakers and lawmakers are, that we uh, may not have that luxury, that AI is happening so quickly um, and the release of AI music is happening so quickly um, that we may be forced with the question, you know, what happens if somebody wants to submit an AI work uh, for a Grammy nomination? Can AI uh, qualify for Grammys. And so again, it's interesting, we kind of came back to the same principle uh, that the Copyright Office did, which is that we are here to recognize and applaud human creativity. We're here to recognize and celebrate human excellence in music. And, and that's what the award is for. And so we released some clarifying rules um, this summer coming out of our Board of Trustees meeting, which Anna was a part of, um, to basically clarify that to be uh, to qualify for a Grammy nomination or Grammy award, a work has to have um, a human creator behind it. Now there can be AI elements of the work. So for example, um, if you created a song and all the lyrics uh, of that song and the notes were composed by an AI program, but the work was performed um, by people that went in and, and performed the song and, and worked on it in the studio, um, then that could be nominated and, and qualify to win a Grammy in the performance categories, uh, but it could not qualify and be nominated or win a Grammy in songwriting or composition categories. Uh, and the reverse is true. If you write a great song um, by yourself, uh, but then you have an AI program create a performance, an AI generated performance of that song. Uh, you could submit that work um, to the Grammy Awards and you could be uh, nominated for songwriter of the year or a songwriter category in your genre. Uh, but that song, that work would not qualify for any of our performance based awards. And so again, it's the, the part that has human creation behind it uh, that can qualify and the part that's created solely by AI uh, cannot qualify for an award show. And so it's given us an opportunity early on to really try to practice what we're talking about and put it into action and kind of demonstrate what that looks like in the real world. And this may not be the end of the process for us as we get um, new works, as we get challenged with different ideas. Um, you know, this is something that can evolve and that we can revisit, but we think this is an important first step and an important uh, first principle to protect uh, creators and the art that they create. So that's kind of a, a quick summary of a lot of different activity that's happening. Uh, we're also part of a broad coalition uh, called the Human Artistry Campaign uh, that started as a collection of music organizations, but is now uh, much broader to, than that and includes dozens of organizations across the creative industries, um, really embracing those same principles that we know uh, that we all embrace technology and technological tools, but we want to protect the human artists that are at the core of that uh, creative spark. Um, and you know, obviously, as you watch the news and you see things happening like uh, the artist, uh, the SAG after strikes and the writer strikes, AI is certainly a huge part um, of those conversations and, and the concerns that they have about getting properly compensated um, for our friends in the writers community and, and, um, and the visual arts and graphics community. They're certainly seeing 
um, a lot of disruption from AI as well. So there's a lot of common cause um, across the creative industries in the space. Amazing. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's the Wild West in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, it's it's so um, it's so it's comforting and also terrifying to, you know, to know that there's so much uh, thought um, going into it um, as this technology seems to ramp up and, and become such um, uh, ubiquitous, ubiquitous uh, part of our our um, our creative industry. Um, um, I want to, uh, let's see, we, we got one question. Um, I've got a whole bunch of questions, but I saw one came in. So I'm just gonna um, read it. This is from Robbie. Um, Robbie says, uh, I, would, I would think just like uh, other software tools that, uh, that there are end, end user license agreements in the various AI tools. Uh, so ownership of AI for creative work uh, could come into play based on that, uh, um, based on that tool that is used. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? On you know, um, can can you know just by send, signing that end end user license agreement, um, can you uh, claim claim ownership? Is that open to anybody? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I, I think it's an interest. I think it's a, perhaps an untested question. I think in terms of of where the ownership lies, and I think. Um, and, and I know some of some AI software, just anecdotally, I know it's it's different for different um, uh, services. So I, I'm aware of some music creation AI services where they, uh, you know, maintain that they will create, hold the copyright to any work that you create using their tool. Um, and so I think um, some of those are, are kind of business model decisions, and it's kind of interesting. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out and you know, commerce versus the legal ramifications of, of where that ownership lies. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's it's untested territory there. Uh, Nicole, did you have anything on that end? No, no, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, what it what it all comes down to when I'm looking at it is, you know, there's all these different points um, uh, where ownership could be taken, you know, um, is it uh, is the prompt copyrightable? Um, is the, uh, you know, the, um, what gets um, generated by the prompt is that, you know, can you uh, infer that that is human created because it was a human created prompt, you know, that that's a lot of the discussion. Um, I, do you all have thoughts on, you know, on where, where that might go or, or where we're at? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a key question on the sliding scale of, you know, whether the copyright office is deciding what's copyrightable as, as we think about you know what qualifies for for Grammy recognition and as as policymakers wrestle with ownership I think you know I've, I've talked with songwriters who have said that they use some prompt tools to get ideas like they'll they'll enter in a prompt they'll get a list of phrases and words and then they like play with them they you know toss them back and forth they might change them they add to them they write to them I think that's a, a more clear-cut case where um, you have human interaction with the work and creating something new that has human ownership to it. Um, I think if you clearly just type in a word or a prompt and uh, just take what gets spit out at you um, and verbatim, I think that's kind of a clear cut case, the other direction of something that's purely created by the AI. Uh, but there's, there's definitely a murky middle uh, between those two things. And I think that's where, um, There'll be a lot more really interesting conversations like this one happening. Um, okay, so I, because we're talking, you know, about bluegrass music and how it intersects with this uh, technology, um, I'm gonna, you know, just throw this out there. Can where we're at currently today, can AI accurate, accurately and believably replicate the sound of acoustic instruments? <laughs> This might be one for me to field, um, and I think it's a I think it's a little bit of a nuanced question. I think if you're just you know talking about the the sound, you know the sonic stamp, um, then I would say yes because um, we we've, we've gotten to the point where um, and especially if you consider the voice an instrument, there's a lot of very voiced uh, you know focused things. Um, so I think you know much like the sample, the Dolly Parton sample that I played, where you can hear it right away, and you're like, oh, I I know this person, you know, and um, that is not quite something that um, 
it was told explicitly to do, but something that it learned to do. And so I think we're at the point where audio-based AIs that are able to kind of um, access spectral features of audio recordings, um, I think we're at the point where they can replicate a, a, a bite of audio, but what they struggle to do is to create something that has the, um, on, on one hand, long-term structure. Um, and it, they're getting much better at it, but um, on one hand, the long-term structure, and on the second hand, it's still like human-like expression that you would hear um, from, from an actual person playing or singing. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a yes and no. <laughs> on, at an instant, I would say yes, but on the long-term, much, much harder um, to do and much scarier, I think, when that moment really happens. So uh, in terms of that kind of technology, is it actually, um, is it actually building its own um, uh, unique, uh, you know, sound of a, a, the note of a banjo or something, or is it borrowing samples from, you know, the, um, the inputs uh, into the uh, model to um, kind of, you know, create some, is, is it borrowing those samples or is it, um, kind of creating its own based on the spectral uh, elements um, or is it you know kind of creating some sort of um, combination of like this is this note on the banjo from seven different banjo samples to create that? Yeah that's a great question. Um, I think the I I don't know that I can answer it fully yet because I'm not sure that we understand fully what um, they're doing but in my research what I've seen um, to uh, suggest that it's something like the the, the latter um, idea that you suggested where it, it's taking some amalgam of sounds, um, but likely from, you know, the same instrument, like if you were to have um, like a bunch of Tony Rice samples playing guitar or like Norman Blake, I always associate Norman Blake with like a really unique guitar sound and, and vocal sound. Um, and if you were to take something like that, I would expect that where we're at with AI today, um, if you were to feed it enough Norman Blake recording, it would learn to um, pull all of those samples together in a way that I don't, um, I don't think it is just replicating directly, but learning to build those kind of overtone series that his guitar produces when it plays different notes. Um, so it, it seems like it's learning to approximate um, and capture those like spectral qualities um, rather than um, kind of direct sampling, uh, which is which is kind of an interesting thing because I, I think I was saying this before the chat, I've heard some analogies to hip hop sampling and things like that. Um, and, and obviously the, the biggest difference is, is that when sampling has been done in the past, it's always been a conscious thing and there's, it's a whole culture around it um, of, you know, taking pieces of, of existing artworks and using them in a very deliberate way and you know exactly where they came from. And then here, it's a much more ambiguous thing where there it, it feels like there's some kind of sampling happening, um, but the sampling is kind of this gathering and learning from and approximating and replicating. Hating, um, and it's much more unconscious. You can't put your finger on one thing and say, oh, this is exactly where this came from. Um, but you can kind of get a ballpark for, oh, you know, this sounds like Norman Blake's guitar. It sounds like the sound of the instrument, but I can't, you know, um, pick out a chunk of audio that this that this came from because I don't I don't think that's how it's uh, doing it. It's just gathering, <laughs> you know, at large. I think that's where the significance of, of human agency comes in is, you know, if, when you talk about the context of sampling, to your point, there's um, intention and um, creativity behind even the choices that are being made and how they're being made um, to use that sample uh, and place it in a work to reinvent it or, you know, reclaim it in some way um, versus something being done by a machine, which doesn't have the same motivation or the same thought or the same creative spark behind the choices that it's making. The choices are being made algorithmically. And I think that's the distinction where you can say on, in one sense, there's a, an, there's something analogous, analogous about the sampling, but in another sense, they're not really analogous at all because of, of that difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I should also add that this whole field of research of interpretability of trying to, you know, break these things open and figure out what they're what they're actually doing is is really new and um quite difficult. So I expect that, you know, over time we'll learn more about how these how these are actually working. And then maybe I'll have a more concrete answer 
um, to your question and I can tell you exactly what's going on rather than um, some suggestion. But yeah, I think we'll we'll see more in future years. Yeah. And yeah, I just would tell what you brought up um, about human agency. I think it's really interesting because I think as these models um, continue to learn, um, I, I wonder how much um, how much we are going to be able to replicate that human agency in some sense, you know, as it learns, you know, um, uh, it, we talk like, it's like the demon in the corner, <laughs> beast in the corner. Um, as, as we talk about um, how it, uh, how it learns and how it, um, you know, kind of uses things, you know, is it going to be able to interpret, uh, you know, human emotion and be able to narrow its, uh, you know, um, its focus uh, from its collection um, to to really hone in on that um, human agency and, and emotion. Um, that's going to be a really interesting thing going forward because um, I think it, it might get you know um, uh, sophisticated enough to to be indiscernible at some point, which is terrifying and um, kind of exciting. You know, just kind of as a you know watching watching the beast in the corner work. Um, um, I want to um, because we're talking about you know kind of the the inputs um, going into um, AI, uh, these music collections that you spoke of, Nicole, um, you know, you had that that chart with, you know, the those music collections. Um, what are those drawing on? Uh, you know, how do how are artists getting their their music in there? Or are they? Um, can they opt out of them? Is that, you know, is that, you know, I just kind of feel like, you know, maybe a lot of that, a lot of, there's a lot of fear from artists of like, I didn't, I didn't subscribe to that. You know, why is my music being used? Is it being used? Um, can I opt out of it? Should I opt in it, into it? Um, that kind of thing. So if you could talk a little bit more about those collections that are, that are being used to, uh, to generate. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I, so I can't speak too much to how um, they've been collected, you know, on, on the large scale um, and if people have opted in and opted out and um, I'm, I'm not sure of that. Um, and I'm, I don't know if Todd, you might know a little bit more, um, but I do know that um, at least the first one um, that I showed the um, FMA data set, uh, to my knowledge has, has been put together as a deliberately kind of open source um, kind of thing where they've curated samples from people who are willing to um, produce open source music and and things like that. So th I know there's some of that happening. Um, some of the other ones are um, more proprietary and some of them, I'm not um, totally sure what exactly is in them. Um, I just know that they're generally, you know, pop or or um, even folk musics or things like that. And I know, you know, about how many samples they are because um, they released them in research papers or things like that. Um, so I, I am not totally sure how they're being collected. Um, I wish I could say more about that. Um, some collections are more transparent than others. Um, I, I know certainly for things like Music Cats, um, there's an element of uh, YouTube clips where um, there are like 10 or 30 second clips from YouTube videos um, and there's a really wide range of videos and I've watched some of the bluegrass ones and they're just kind of from all over the spectrum um, some of them interestingly enough are not actually bluegrass related I don't I don't know why they're in there but um, they've been tagged as bluegrass and they have nothing to do and some of them are not even music um, they're trying to subvert the genre yeah no <laughs> And then that happens in data set collections uh, where there's, you know, some mistakes, uh, especially when it's at a, a large scale. So I I think, you know, that'll get sorted out over time. But um, but I'm not totally sure what the usage um, rights are around those clips that they've collected or, um, you know, what the what the permissions or the copyright, if they're under Creative Commons. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Um, I just know that that is that's what they're that's what they tend to be working with. Yeah, I'd say that that matches my understanding. I know there are some applications that do have, like you said, open source or you know public domain works or works that are perfectly acceptable to be using. And but then there are some, as you said, that are not completely transparent, where it's it's not clear the source of um, you know what we like to say is being scraped. Um, and if they are 
scraping the work of, of artists and creators um, whose work is, is copyrighted, um, we would like to know about it. <laughs> I think there should be some disclosure um, and, and licensing in place for that to take place. Yeah, because at this point, uh, you know, kind of reverse engineering something to see what was, you know, used to input something is that's not possible right now, right? That's right, and it's it's and you can't um, unlearn it, right? <laughs> like the algorithm, if they've already scraped it, um, and, and then somebody, an artist or a rights holder, wants to opt out and, and say, no, I don't want you to use my work. Well, how do you how do you un unwind that? You know, and, and it's um, it's interesting. It's it's sort of analogous but worse the, to what happened in um, in streaming, where you had streaming services growing and, and um, expanding their works that they were available, and they weren't completely sure if they had licensed everything that they were p making available, right? Or if they had licensed it, they weren't sure if who to pay, or you know, they they followed the copyright office process for putting out a notice of intent that they were using it, but they weren't sure who to make the payment to. So they would say, well, we'll just put all this money in a drawer. And once we figure out who to, to pay, we'll pay them. And which is not the way the system's supposed to work. That's, you know, we would argue that that was infringement, um, that they were using works without, you know, compensating the owner of the works. And so we, we spent five years creating a law um, the Music Modernization Act to fix that, um, but it was well, we'll we'll do it now and we'll figure it out later. Um, that that kind of permissionless innovation where um, we're, we know we're supposed to pay somebody and make sure this is licensed and we'll do that, but for now we're just going to get get the product out. And so it, it's somewhat a little bit of that same mentality, um, I think, with some of these these AI models. Yeah, and the Music Modernization Act is just celebrating five years. Is that correct? That's right. Five right. years ago. So. And, and it's worked great. The, the new model um, for, you know, to digress, but the, the new model, to, which pays mechanical licenses for, for songwriters and composers, they've paid out over a billion dollars under the new construct. And so um, it is working. Um, again, this is probably an area where AI would be useful, is that they still have a lot of data to be matched. Um, from historical uses, um, but we're really encouraged by the progress they're making. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we've got another question. Um, uh, would it be correct to describe the AI process as a amalgamated <laughs> appropriation? Sorry, I'm in trouble with that word. Uh, and at what point does the machine become creative on the basis of, it, of its appropriated learning? And then the follow-up is, uh, where does the credit go for that creation? That's a great question. I, I think we all wanna know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, I wanna know myself. I, um, I don't wanna make any hard and fast statements about you know, how we can um, classify what AI is doing or, um, yeah, I, I think this is something we really need to suss out and figure out where we draw the line of creativity. It's certainly an interesting, interesting question. Um, and, and certainly not the first time it, it's come up. I think this is something people have been thinking about for a while throughout history in different contexts. Um, but, but it, it absolutely points to a conversation that we need to be having about where that line of creativity happens and, and what defines musical creativity. Um, and I think we all have our own, you know, personal thoughts about that. But um, but I'll leave it there. Yeah, they're they're almost um, almost existential type questions. But I, I personally I think we should be careful too not to overly anthropomorphize um, you know the, these programs that are machine learning and, and algorithms. And so I think when we use use words like creativity and create, um, that we should be careful about what those words mean and what we're actually talking about and, and make sure that we're assigning attributes um, correctly. Um, so I know that we probably have a lot of songwriters um, in our audience um, and also artists, but I wanna focus on songwriters right now. Um, what are some of the biggest concerns um, for songwriters and also what are some of the uh, greatest opportunities? We've kind of talked about, you know, kind of uh, using AI to kind of generate uh, lyric ideas and that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, 
what are what are some of the biggest concerns, opportunities, threats, that kind of thing? Jump into an interesting experience. I hate to throw out something that's a concern, but um, but I'm married to a songwriter. <laughs> um, my husband, his name is J M Clifford. He's a he'll be a IBMA uh, showcase artist this year. So he's really you know doing the the songwriter thing and doing the artist thing. He will be in the songwriter showcase as well. And um, so it's something we you know as a couple spend a lot of time talking about. Um, and one of the things we did, we we were visiting with his parents last weekend, and um, you know, and my mother-in-law said, "Hey, can you can you ask uh, ChatGPT to generate a, a bluegrass song about you know uh, the town that we live in, or, or something that to that effect?" And it and it did it in like eight seconds. It generated a, a set of lyrics and and like little chord letter suggestions, and we were like, "Ah, oh my god." Um, you know, and that kind of thing is really scary because of, I think, the immediacy with which it can happen. Um, but of course, there are, are, and I think we alluded to this before, creative opportunities to say, okay, maybe this is a prompt to start with, um, just to get your, to jog your your brain. I've heard of uh, writers doing that um, for writing articles or, or emails or something like that, just to, to give you something to start with that you, you change a bunch, but maybe you'll take an idea and say, oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't think of that. Um, so I've certainly heard of people doing things like that. Um, and it, and it's a concern on one hand that this is something that can happen kind of en masse and with a lot of immediacy. Um, but, you know, I th there are, yeah, as we mentioned before, there are definitely um, creative opportunities somewhere, hidden somewhere in there as well that I think people, you know, will discuss. It also, it, it was just, it was lyrics and some chord suggestions. Um, it didn't it didn't actually generate a melody for you that was left to you to create yeah okay. yeah this was a cheat um on my phone so it it just you know gave us a kind of like a guitar tab chords uh, and they were the same every time so if you say bluegrass and then pipe in whatever topic you want um based on my experience with it it'll just give you the same exact set of chords in the same one order. four five yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> C, F. Always in the same key. So, I mean, it it understands it in some way, but it's, yeah, it's the same every time. Um, so there's, I think there was a lot to unpack there, but I can, I can put that out as a recent experience. Um, that, well, that's, yeah. that's actually encouraging that it's the same chord progression every time. Yeah, yeah. it feels like, um, you know, that AI can, can, can replicate cliches really well. Um, but I don't know that it can create, you know, emotional experiences and personal details and, and expression um, the way that that good songwriters do. And so I think, um, you know, maybe there's a there's a bandwidth there where it's where it's threatening, um, depending on you know what kind of music you write. But I think there's a um, still a clear difference between the real and the counterfeit um, when real songwriting touches on real human experience. Absolutely. Yeah. The song that we, you know, that that the the lyrics that ChatGPT generated were it to me it felt like a not a knock to ChatGPT, but it felt like a a Wikipedia list of like interesting thoughts about, you know, whatever place we asked it to talk about. Um and in my experience watching my husband go through his songwriting process, you know, he's he's got his own habits of things that he does and he takes lyrics and he looks at them and he takes them apart and he puts them with melodies and he's just like oh how does this work how does this make me feel you know what stories does this tell yeah how does it hit you how does it hit you and there's a real human element to that that you know no matter what amount of you know statistical prediction a machine does um that kind of thing is is you know really special to human nature um and it's beautiful it's a beautiful thing to watch so I um yeah, so I think that's that super special. Um and something songwriters should absolutely lean into, lean into your stories, lean into the things that you bring. Yeah, on on a philosophical level, I mean it it is bringing us a lot closer to um to art and creativity and how it connects with our our beings and our souls and our uh human experience. Um and that's that's really wonderful. So, you know, we're getting, you know, to a point where, you know, we're having to 
discern, you know, what is what is real and what connects and what is, uh, you know, kind of more generic or, or doesn't connect. Um, that's actually uh, a, maybe might be the best thing that comes out of uh, all of this technology is that we connect further um, with with art uh, and with music. Uh, Todd, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, no, I, I think we, we touched on it. Yeah, that's, that's it. Julie, can I jump in with one more quick yeah. thought on that? Um, as, as I've thought about this, I've, I've been kind of ruminating over this idea that you know, it's summer, it's festival season. If you're a bluegrass musician, you know, like that's what you want to do. <laughs> you're there, you're ready, you're camping, you know, you're picking. Um, so I, and I thought about it and I was like, you know, this whole mechanical thing, I could spend so much time in this mechanical world that I find myself really craving live music experiences. I, I, I don't crave cr like camping in a hundred degree weather right now, but uh, I do. <laughs> But I do really love, um, you know, having that experience. And I think that as bluegrass musicians, it's something we do so well. And it's something that's always been, you know, a part of this kind of music making is, is leaning into that. So I think we have a real opportunity here to show what live music can do and how special it is. Um, kind of, I don't want to say as a counterpoint, because that feels like really, you know, juxtaposy, but, um, but as something that, you know, in the face of all this technological change that we can still come together um, over live music and have those experiences and and particularly for this genre that that's a real opportunity to say hey I'm playing come out tonight you know or come to this festival and um, so I think I think we could see that be a real moment and and I would love it I I feel like I'm I'm wanting that yeah I I absolutely connect with you there I'm I'm heading off to rocky grass and the you know 90 degree heat this weekend so yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to you know sweating and listening to music and uh you know there's there's uh you know it's like auto tune can't uh can't you know do anything with a single mic you know so um there's there's something really wonderful and and authentic about that that just can't be uh can't be faked um so yeah i think live music um and that spontaneity and everything the campground scene everything that comes along with bluegrass music it's it's the whole community um, that that's not gonna that's not gonna be taken away um, from us. Uh, so that's uh, we've got that for sure. Um, I want to um, kind of go into um, the idea of fair use, uh, Nicole. In in leading up to this, you had kind of mentioned uh, this idea of fair learning, um, and um, you would kind of. Uh, you know, I'm just going to read the question that that you uh, that you put because um, it was said so well. Uh, can a company or or a researcher copy pre-recorded copyrighted recordings into their private server to train a generative AI model, um, or does the act of copying infringe uh, the copyright of those recordings? I have no thoughts on this. This was a pure curiosity. <laughs> I'm not qualified to speak on this at all. <laughs> But I do want to know the answer. <laughs> sure. So you know, I, I will. I'll. I'll speak very lightly um, as 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 a lawyer, but not a practicing lawyer. But you know, fair, fair use is a specific defense to infringement, um, and so it, it assumes that um, there's an accusation of infringement, and then the fair use is your excuse for for why it's, it was okay for you to do it. I think. You know the idea of doing it on a private server to train an AI, but then what is what is the AI going to be used for after that, right? And and so it still carries it still carries the that initial use with it um, for any future application that you're using the AI for. And so I think um, you know that hypothetical is almost kind of a really clever, almost like a clever way to try to navigate around the idea of using somebody's copyrighted work. Um, and so there are, there is a fair use test and there are fair use uses of copyright that are acceptable. Um, but I think the default setting should always be, um, yeah, if you're using somebody's copyrighted work, you should, you should get their permission to use it. And these things will will get litigated, I'm sure, by by a lot of other people. It's it's a good time to be a lawyer, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um. Uh. Yeah. Let's see. Um. I've got so many questions. Um. 
So uh, going back to, you know, we asked the question about songwriting and, and how a AI can, um, you know, some of the threats and opportunities and that kind of thing. And I want to ask the same question for um, for artists specifically, because they are dealing with recorded works um, and not just, you know, the, the uh, you know, kind of the, the craft of songwriting, they're dealing with the craft of production as well. Um, and that kind of thing. What are what are the biggest concerns? Um, what are what should uh, artists be paying attention to? What should they be asking questions about? Um, how can they protect themselves? And also what opportunities do they have? Well, from my perspective, I'll, I'll say I think really um, it, the, the image and likeness question is is of paramount importance um, as I look at AI from the artist's perspective, and I think that's a place that is ripe for for policy making and, and legislating. I think it'll happen slowly um, because because it always does, but but that's okay if we're making sure that it's done the right way and and done correctly. Um, and so I, I think that's a place where um, We'll need to be vigilant, but I, you know, what I do at the Recording Academy is I'm always trying to get artists involved where they can advocate for themselves and give themselves a voice and I think to participate. Uh, and I think that'll be a critical part of of this conversation is is artists and creators um, getting involved and and speaking out to say that things these things matter to them and that they need this protection. Uh, and so I know that'll be a big focus of the work that we do. Yeah, and I may just um, jump onto that a little bit from my perspective. One of the things that stood out to me that I'm I'm kind of curious to see where this goes is um, the idea that even in their early stages, these these AIs are really good at learning. Like I said before, spectral signatures, like voices, and 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 how they're constructed in terms of uh, frequencies, you know, over time. And um, it makes me wonder if we'll see more. Um, like I know there's. Uh, a story that I read recently about how like Grimes licensed her voice and said, you know, if you want to use my voice, fine, but um, there's there's a license attached to it or something like that. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting idea because it suggests that one voice is something that you can, you know, put a stamp on and license. Um, but also, um, you know, kind of an opportunity in a in one sense for people to say. Here, here could be another way that we generate money um, based on, you know, my um, my musical talents, and and I think people have really strong opinions about that, um, both good and bad. So, but it is something that I've seen, and I'm curious to know where that will go, or what opportunities there might be for artists in that regard, or or risks for artists in that regard. Um, but yeah, I think both of those questions about. Yeah, if voice to what degree it can be licensed and, and if there are opportunities there is something that I definitely want to know more about. And I think the key there is is making sure creators are empowered to be able to make their own choices. So if you are someone like Grimes and you want to lean into this, these new opportunities and these new possibilities, that you have the ability to do that in a way that works for you and that you're you you're protected and so that you're empowered to go make those deals and be an entrepreneur and, and figure out new models and, and ways to use your talent in that way, instead of somebody being able to do it without your involvement, which would kind of be the worst version of that. It would be great to see some technology come out where creators know that there's a place where they can go if they're interested in doing something like that to um, to say, you know, okay, here's my legal protection, here's, here's my, you know, um, here's my, <laughs> my voice that I, that I want to license, but I still, you know, have yeah, like you said, I'm still empowered in this way, um, and I can still make the the art that I want to make. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting idea of an artist having some kind of, you know, policy statement where it's like if you you know use my voice or if you um, uh, create an artificial version of my voice, you know, this is this is what I require and that kind of thing, and and really being able to. Um, to do that, um, you know, I imagine, you know, that involves uh, lawyers and, and that kind of thing. I know that um, uh, we've got the small claims court now um, uh, to to pursue stuff like that. Would that be at the federal level? You know, and, and I'm just thinking about this, you know, if an artist or um, and the a state of, you know, uh, like 
Earl Scruggs or you know something like that um, can uh, can they pursue that? How do they go about pursuing um, you know some perceived infringement or uh, you know um, asking for a licensing fee or or something like that? How might an artist go about doing that? Should they? Is it worth it? Um, opening that one up, can of worms, go for it. So I, you know, I, I think currently under the current law, um, depending on what state they're they're domiciled in, they, they there could be some courses of action that would, but that would be limited to the state juris, state of jurisdiction, right? And so I think that's when we talk about wanting to create a federal standard um, that guarantees that kind of protection. You know, that's um, you know, there's a hole there right now that needs to be filled. Uh, and it's something that you know a lot of organizations here in DC are, are talking about and, and wanting to get Congress to look at. Um, and um, along those same lines, you know, you can even think about extending it to um, the same artist, like uh, somebody, maybe not a license, but um, but the idea of, of capturing your voice. And I again will bring it back to somebody like Tony Rice, you know, who, who had a situation where. Um, you know, as time went on, his voice changed and, you know, things happen, life happens. So, and if you're somebody in that situation and you say, okay, well, I want to make a record and I want to be able to sing like I did, you know, in, in this year, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, or whatever, or if you had, a, you know, an injury or something, um, I mean, in theory, the technology exists where you could take your own voice and say, um, you know, here's, I can, I can put this on a record or I can do something like that. And um, so I think those opportunities present themselves as well. I know I've heard of um, musicians who have had physical injuries that they have a really difficult time playing their instrument, but through AI, they've been able to kind of re-engage with old recordings that they've had and create something new that is kind of less physically taxing. Um, and, and those are the real nuances <laughs> of, of this, but I think there are those kind of niche opportunities there that, um, also might come into some of this stuff that we're talking about and begin to be part of the equation as well. It's a really interesting example of some of the positive possibilities, I think, of, of the technology. I'm curious, Anna, if, to flip the questions on you just from the from the studio side and, and from what you do and mastering and restoring work and just like where do you see both the opportunities and the threats of, and where have you already seen it maybe in terms of the kind of tools that are out there? Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, just specifically for me, there's all sorts of AI mastering tools that are out there. You know, um, I haven't heard one that can um, really engage with the music the way a human does, um, you know, from a mastering perspective, you know, that that's, that's what I'm doing um, is really making sure that, you know, the, the music is, uh, impacting the audience in the way that the, um, you know, the artist and, and the producer intended. And um, I haven't seen that happen with the AI models, but I'm sure that, you know, they, um, they will continue to do that. Um, there's, there are certainly tool sets. Um, you know, I do a lot of audio restoration um, as well. And uh, the neural net um, has been used, um, you know, to kind of uh, help restore recordings. I certainly use that, um, you know, to, match the ambiance, you know, when I um, have to extract some noises, uh, but I don't, but extracting those noises might, you know, eliminate some of the ambiance of that portion of the recording using, you know, that kind of neural net tool to, to restore that um, uh, is, is really helpful. And also, you know, from an educational standpoint, you know, learning, um, learning uh, how, uh, you know, the, the kind of, um, uh, the spec Nicole has mentioned the spectral signatures, and I, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with what she's talking about that. I look at spectro spectrograms every day. Google it if you haven't seen them. They're gorgeous. Uh, I really want to make wallpaper out of them. They're beautiful um, <laughs> just visually. Um, but it's, you know, uh, being able to analyze, uh, analyze that, not just visually and um, auditorily, like, you know, um, myself, but have uh, have a tool that can look at that and say, this is the general signature, um, and then be able to kind of um, analyze it um, and see what needs to be done is, is really, really helpful. Um, and looking at, uh, at issues with recordings and that kind of thing. Like I can, I can tell if you, you know, recorded uh, 
your vocals at a different sample rate than you know the rest of the <laughs> from the, the rest of the uh, recording. Um, so you know, being able to look at that and you know maybe um, something can be done with AI uh, to kind of restore the fidelity there and that kind of thing. Um, so it's certainly being used. Um, you know, that's just from my specific perspective um, in in kind of the end uh, the end of the chain of the production process. But it it is uh, it is being used a lot. Um, um, yeah. So yeah, there's there's a there's a lot going on and it's moving very quickly. And you know, I I think about like uh, Todd, you had mentioned the idea of uh, digital watermarking. Um, you know, which is a fascinating concept, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, all I have to do is run that, you know, that signal through my analog chain and it erases everything, all that, all that digni uh, digital signature because I'm creating a new digital file. So, you know, there are <laughs> hacks there that could um, eliminate that, that, uh, you know, that signature. So, um, or that watermark. So, um, yeah, I'm really curious to see where it goes. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, um, moving on. Oh, we have a question here um, from Mark. Uh, he asks, uh, what about the trend of artists curating their own AI tools based on training sets uh, of their own material? Uh, avoids infringement issues, but also creates a whole new set of issues. I did have this kind of thought, um, you know, you had mentioned Norman Blake and, and you know, or, or Tony Rice or something, where you have a constricted data set um, to, you know, a specific artist or a specific style. Um, I see, I see some opportunities there, um, but, you know, um, just from a, a policy standpoint and, uh, you know, um, copyright standpoint, um, uh, and also, you know, just the tool standpoint, uh, is that possible? Is that accessible to use, to create your own data set? So, um, those are the questions from each of you, uh, around, around Mark's question there. It's a fascinating idea. I, I think, you know, if the question there then also becomes business issues, right? So do you own, do you own your own recordings? Do you own your own publishing? Do you have the rights to manipulate it and use it in that way? Um, but if, or, or are you in an, an alignment with your label and publisher to, to use the works in that way? But I think that's a really interesting way to leverage this technology um, to create works that where you're involved in it, you know, you're, you're the one driving the process, you're the one benefiting from it, and it's all your work um, that's being used as the input. So I think, um, yeah, it's a really interesting hypothetical. Yeah, and I can just add, um, you know, it, the technology definitely exists to do, uh, you know, legality aside, and just speaking on the technology alone, that, that definitely exists, um, those kind of orange dot algorithms on the on the graph that I showed are singing voice conversion algorithms, I would think are um, the ways that people tend to do that kind of thing, um, partly because they're they're good at just isolating, you know, voice and, and doing stuff like that, but also partly because there's there's quite a few at this point um kind of uh plug and play tools that you can find on the um, you know, that are open source or, or that people have created and you have to pay for different things, um, that, that, that option is actually, you know, available <laughs> to play with. Um, yeah. And, and it remains to see how it'll be handled if you, you know, own those recordings or, you know, as Todd was talking about. Thanks. Um, this, this idea had, had kind of come up to me, um, uh, while, uh, Nicole was giving her presentation um of of just an opportunity um to you know kind of um look at, at if you can restrict that data set uh you know to say a decade or um uh you know you take a, a kind of subgenre like jam grass or something and analyze the trends of that um you know I, nicole this is kind of because you're so into the analysis you know kind of right up your alley in terms of how we um, how we track our the history of our music and how we recognize things and and maybe you know um, using that to kind of predict trends as well um, are we seeing that happening um, are you using that kind of thing um, I would love for you to you know just talk about that yeah that's a great question um, so I think I as I understand that the academic side of things is a little bit different when you're not dealing with um, 
you know, uh, generating your own music or thing, but and when things are purely analytical. Um, so I, we are seeing a bit more of that definitely in academic research. Um, I know there are some studies that have come out that are looking at kind of large scale um, harmonic trends over time, or um, even I, I think it'd be super interesting to look at how, because these AIs tend to be across the board so good at looking at spectral signatures, how the, the sound of music has changed over time. You know, the, the I don't wanna say affect, but the sound of, you know, recordings of people's voices um, or in different subgenres. Um, actually, I think a really interesting place to look for that information would be um, music streaming companies, recommendation companies, um, because they're, at, and I don't know all the, <laughs> they don't kind of make public to my knowledge all the, the details about their proprietary system. Um, but what I do know is that they have a lot of data <laughs> Um, and they do a lot of analysis on that data to try to understand what trends are happening and how that influences how people might be consuming music um, and listening to it. So I think it would be interesting for sure to ask someone who you know, works for one of those companies or has kind of understanding of how they work, because I'm sure that they have some ideas about trends. Um, but absolutely, this kind of technology could could certainly be used and, and really is being used to to look at those things. Um, and I think it'll be more so as it becomes more available to people, you know, as it as it's becoming. Um, the big challenge I think is, is figuring out, you know, how to narrow down that scope of what you wanna look at. Um, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm just thinking like, you know, it, that is, uh, one of the greatest opportunities I think of AI is this ability to reach a wider wider audience and um, to cast a wider net. Um, so I, I think that is that is huge for artists. And I, you know, we we are talking about a lot of the concerns and the and the fears around A and I and AI and that kind of thing. And and I just want to you know highlight that that huge opportunity for us as as we talk about you know how um, bluegrass can you know really charge into the future and and really find new audiences and get more people engaged you know ai is is going to be you know critical to that i think um and you know that and and dragging your your reluctant friends to music festivals of course um which is you know never going to go away so um yeah so i think that's a that's a huge um huge opportunity um, so we have, um, you know, about 20 minutes left. We don't have to use all that 20 minutes, but I do want to um, talk about uh, what um, what kinds of things can. Uh, well, let me let me back up because I know that um, uh, uh, there's uh, a lot of broadcasters um, and radio is huge in in the bluegrass scene, and um, I I want to talk about. Um, I want to address that audience because I think, you know, we've talked about music generation and um, that kind of thing, but I want to talk about radio broadcasting and, uh, and uh, is there a scenario where broadcasters could get, you know, uh, replaced by, by AI um, and, uh, you know, and can AI have a personality uh, on, uh, you know, um, on the airwaves uh, that that could overtake, and is that is that okay? Is that being discussed? Um, what's what might be being done about it? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think the threat of, of the automation is something that we've already seen um, with with especially the large radio broadcasters, the conglomerates, you know, where they've consolidated um, and both local stations and on-air talent. Um, you know, I know on, on one of the streaming services that I use, that I have a, they have an AI DJ, like a virtual DJ that, that creates playlists, but with, you know, an, an audible DJ, you know, narrating it for me. <laughs> so I, it doesn't seem out of reach at all that, that broadcasters um, could do that. I think especially, you know, as those tools become more accessible and more, you um, readily available. And so I think it's the value proposition of what, how do you connect with your audience and what your audience wants and, and for uh, especially local radio stations where having that personal connection and personal relationship really matters and is what provides value um, to the people that listen to the station. I think that's the safeguard. Um, but I think, you know, as the industry is looking for efficiencies, um, 
it could be an attractive tool for some. Absolutely. Yeah, I it, just keep coming back down to that idea of community and, and human connection. And I, you know, I think that we need to really just double down on that. I think we've been straying away from it for for so long with social social media and you know all the other um, uh, you know kind of isolations uh, within our our culture these days. I think it's it, it's all driving us back towards that. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Todd. Um, okay, so um, I want to talk about you know what specifically can you know those that are that are tuning in right now. Uh, as artists, as songwriters, as you know, publishers and managers and broadcasters, what what can they do right now um, to you know either uh, help advocate for um, uh, for uh, intellectual property rights and um, uh, that kind of thing, or how can they use or like what is the most accessible tool for them? What what should what should people take away from this discussion and what should they do right now? All right, you're gonna start with me. I think um, I, I think one is to stay vigilant. I think um, staying informed and staying part of the conversation through avenues like this. I think, um, again, Congress is acting slowly, but they're listening. They're definitely paying attention and they're definitely um, wanting to hear from people that are impacted by AI. And so the, the door is definitely open right now, and whether it's or in an organized fashion or just you individually reaching out to your representatives and letting them know that these issues impact you and that you care about them. Um, you, there is a window where the door is open right now where they want to hear from people about what they think about AI. And that won't always be the case once people start you know, going to their corners and, and staking out what positions they're going to take, um, you know, that that window will close. But right now, you know, people are an open book and, and they want to hear from everyone, you know, and I, I'll say I'll plug for the Recording Academy. If you're a member or engaged in our orbit of what we do, um, we have an initiative coming up um, actually opening at the end of the summer and, and coming up in an oct in October called District Advocate, where we help connect you with your local representative where you can meet with them when they're back home from Washington. Um, AI is certainly going to be one of the issues that we talk about um, through that initiative. And so um, we'll get that information out there and, and encourage you to sign up and participate if, if you're one of our members. And if you're not, there's still different ways you can engage um, that we'll make available to people as well um, to get that messaging um, to Washington, D.C. I, I just want to um, uh point out a couple of things um, just because I've participated in District Advocate Day for many years and it's one of my favorite um, parts of being a member of the Academy uh, to be able to speak directly with your representatives and and represent um, uh, your music community uh, right there. Um, it They are always so grateful to hear from us um, and to recognize that the impact that the that music has to their constituents and their local economies, it's, it's huge. And to be able to speak directly to our experience, um, it's, it's invaluable. Um, I know it's been very helpful for me and it's uh, been very empowering as well. And if you're not a member of the Academy, I'm just gonna plug this uh, grammy.com slash advocacy. Um, you can still go, go there and see um, the specific bills that, uh, um, that are, uh, affecting music creators um, and you can um, send uh, even if you're not a member you can still send uh, send letters to your um, your representatives right right there with a click of a button it's uh, really valuable to tool so grammy.com slash advocacy plugging that for you Todd. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we're recording this because I, I couldn't have said that any better and I'm happy to, to use it I, I'll also note for this um, for this community I think it's important that lawmakers, often don't understand how geographically diverse music is, that there are music makers in communities everywhere across the country. And I think being a voice that speaks up and lets your representative know that, that you're there and that you're making music um, is tremendously helpful and, and, and sometimes an eye opener for, for policymakers who are convinced that you know there's hubs in Los Angeles and Nashville and New York, and that's the only place where music gets made. And I think when their eyes open and realize that there are people in their backyard, you know, in their communities making music, 
um, it changes the way they think about the issues. Absolutely. Yeah. Nicole, what what can be done right now? Yeah. Um, I was just going to jump in and say um, something really close to what Todd said. Um, but I guess from my side of things, you know, particularly as, as someone who works in research, um, I think I tend to have one foot in the in the pool of, you know, developmental research and building these things. And, and not that I build, but like I, I take apart, <laughs> you know, and try to figure out how they work, um, but certainly one foot in that research community. So I think for me, it would be really helpful um, just to have questions, just to have concern, um, to have uh, thoughts, ideas, like whatever it may be, um, because I know when I um, put out research or when I talk about research, I'm really, really um, active in advocating for um, artist rights for songwriter rights and things like that. And so hearing your thoughts and your concerns um, and bringing them back to a community that is involved in building these kinds of things is really helpful because I can, you know, putting out research or meeting people, I can say, hey, you know, this is really important. We need to, we need to make this point to do this. Um, and I think that's a conversation that's happening across all kinds of engineering circles um, or, or people who are involved with, you know, creating and, and understanding these things. Um, so any any thoughts that you have, good or bad, whatever it is, um, I would love to hear it. And, and I would love to bring that to people who, you know, are involved with this kind of um, constructive aspect, uh, especially going forward, you know, as, as this gets more entrenched in, in our world. Um, and also just keep making live music, keep having fun, keep picking, you know, this world is so dynamic and wonderful. So we just need to keep it alive in its spirit that it has been for a long time. So let's keep doing that too. Yeah. And speaking of that, um, speaking of continuing the conversation, uh, I do want to um, say, A, this is being recorded and it will be put up um, for others to watch later. Um, you can, you'll, it'll be up on YouTube. Uh, we'll make sure that you get the link. Um, so you can rewatch it. Um, and this conversation is not done. This, uh, this is a very, very active conversation in our industry right now. Um, and the IBM is, um, is committed to continuing um, to be involved um, and um, converse in this. Um, and to that end, uh, Nicole is going to be presenting at uh, World of Bluegrass this year um, and will be available in person um, uh, in Raleigh at the end of September. Uh, to answer all your questions, to hear your concerns. Um, I know it's going to be a deluge, I'm sure, uh, Nicole, so uh, be ready. I'm going to have lots more questions, um, and, uh, and we're going to keep, uh, keep an eye on everything. But uh, if you're interested, uh, go to ibma.org to get tickets um, uh, to the conference. I'll be there as well. It's one of my favorite weeks of the year. Um, and, uh, and with that, I just want to say... Um, Thank you both. This was a really, really wonderful and uh, very important conversation. It's the beginning of a much larger conversation within our community. Um, it's hugely valuable. I thank you both so much for your expertise and taking the time out of your day uh, to, to speak with, uh, with the IBMA uh, members um, and anyone who might be tuning in. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for everyone, uh, to everyone for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you in Raleigh.